What's going on, guys? Thank you so much for joining me once again. Welcome back to pre-production. Today, I'm talking to filmmakers Matt bettinelli Open and Tyler Gillette. They've worked on projects like VHS, Devil's Do, Southbound, Ready or Not, Scream 5, Scream 6, and now Abigail, which comes out on April 19th. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk to you. I'm from YouTube. You guys I'm a, had your start kind of an interactive uh, adventures for YouTube back when annotations were still a thing on YouTube and people could, you know, click R. choose R. your own annotations. adventure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I miss choose your own adventure uh, videos. They, they just don't exist anymore. But it was such a fun aspect of YouTube that you guys got kind of got a launching pad from. Yeah, I mean, that was that was really the, the start for us was YouTube. And, you know, we made a few short, short shorts and then annotations came around and we were like, we were always searching for a way to make longer stories. You know, we wanted we wanted to make movies and, you know, you keep making these three minute shorts and they're really fun. But as soon as the annotations were available, we were like, oh, we can make a 25 minute movie now, a, you know, a 30 minute thing. Masquerading as a bunch of Pretend shorts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretending to be a bunch of two minute segments. And it, it just, it allowed us to like really design something that felt original and fresh to us that we hadn't really seen in that format before. And I think it also, it, it really helped us start to understand story and like where, you know, where the plot shifts and how the character has to affect that. And because of the low budgets, you know, no budgets, it, it forced us to put character first. And it was like, here are our characters and we're going to put them through hell. And, you know, I think you still see that thread today in the stuff we're making, but it really did start for us doing all of that. Yeah. That stuff on YouTube. Were you able to track the views of which videos were chosen the most to be like okay so that's the path the audience wanted to take <laughs> well it's funny you you we could track the views and there was always this was like the the the, the version of a spoiler with our interactive adventures was always well i saw that the view count on video two was was, was the, the length yeah oh it was length length, length and then yeah and then views because there were yeah. certain people would go back the the wins would always get the most views because Everybody even if you lost, through. you had to go you had to go through them. So um, yeah, we we could track we could track all the views uh, on that side. It was a really amazing, really amazing immediate feedback. It was it, the excitement around like clicking publish on on yeah. one of those one of those interactive adventures. I still I have I feel it. I feel it the great. like excitement and anxiety of it. Just just thinking back on it. But to that end the immediate feedback we we learned really quickly that people would know oh the short ones are the death so i'm going to choose the long one and then so the first thing we did was like well let's make this next death scene a six Seth, minute yeah. long like seven meandering. minutes they die of dehydration in the middle yeah. of the desert <laughs> what did that teach you about audience expectation or did it teach you anything about sort of how to anticipate what an audience might want out of a story if you can kind of see well they seem to enjoy this path or maybe they're just watching this one because they know this one's going to be really fucked up and the other one's you know a little more tame what did that make you anticipate about how to uh, tell a story to an audience? Never getting like too comfortable with any formula. And, you know, I, I think Always that that makes it up. Yeah, that that immediate feedback also forced us to challenge to challenge our perception of the stories that we were making and also the way that we that we made them. And um, I, it was just so it was so, so valuable to to like be, be given that gift of of well, number one, a group of people who I think became fans of our work, but then knowing that we were, that we had a sort of core audience, that they expected us to challenge them, expected us to do new things and different things and to surprise them. And, and part of the fun of designing anything back in those days, and, and really still to this day, is, is designing them with the audience in mind and, and knowing like, oh, we're going to we're going to lead you down this path. And as soon as you start feeling comfortable with what this thing is, we are going to pull the rug out from under you. And That's you're going to have to get You're going to have to get comfortable with a very new idea very quickly. I think that learning to subvert expectations was one of the things we got more than anything from that, specifically from the interactive adventures, because the entire point of it on some level was we're going to lead you into this situation now there's clearly a choice here where you should go, but which one are you going to choose? And then we'd have we'd have lots of conversations about well, what's more fun for us to fuck with the audience, depending on which choice they choose. Yeah, the, the other... obvious, the one that feels like an obvious win, 
should be a death or but or, or is it or are we aware that you think that yeah, we're tricking you we and know so you, you yeah it's, it's princess bride i know that you know that i know that you know that and i think the other thing that we really got from that format too was there the all of those interactive adventures there is a very simple clear goal stated explicitly at the beginning that's like the characters have to reach this place make it to happy hour. you know like almost like board game <laughs> styles like they just have you have to get it from a to z so that then the audience knows no matter how crazy the kind of adventure gets and it goes on so many different paths that they're still just trying to accomplish this one simple thing i think that helped us keep everything kind of grounded and heading in the right direction even when it felt like it was getting crazy yeah i mean and, and i can kind of see you know a, a through line throughout the films you guys have both made in that every filmmaker always tries to subvert expectations in some way but there's a a very real sort of tangible almost calculable way that you both have achieved it especially in this film and ready or not where you present a world that is the world that we've come to believe like this is okay we have a person in case of ready or not we have a person meeting you know in-laws all right we understand right. what this world exactly. looks like yeah this this Very world's familiar this, right yeah. this is a world we all kind of know and live in and then at some point whether it's the midpoint or a little before it it's like no we're actually going to tell this version of the story you liked the story i was telling before and you were invested in that story but now hopefully you like it even more and of course without getting into any spoilers abigail does that really brilliantly i think um one of my favorite aspects of it really was sort of the, I, I, w I wouldn't say cat and mouse, but the intrigue aspect of that first like 40 or so minutes. Yeah. What's going on right now? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? And watching the characters try to figure that out was a lot of fun. Thank you. That means yeah, so a, glad you a ton that. that you like that part of the movie. I, I think for us, uh, the sort of secret to Abigail is, is making sure that the audience falls in love with all of those characters, even though they're, they're, all despicable people that first 40 minutes is really about nuancing the idea of them being anti-heroes and and getting to understand and enjoy the dynamic between that group makes the makes the turn and then what follows the turn so much more interesting and fun and if you don't have that time to get to know them and to enjoy that dynamic then the, then it, the the rest of the rest of the story story just falls flat at the end of the day there's also something fun about seeing them under the pressure of oh there's this big criminal overlord who you know you mess with and now you're in trouble and i think you know us the audience knows oh you've got much bigger problems than <laughs> that my friend like, <laughs> taking a group of seeming experts and yeah. like putting them on abs the wrong path from from the start <laughs> i think we get so used to like main characters can't make mistakes you know that's like it you see it more and more where it's like they have to be infallible and i think there's something fun about that part of the movie where you get to see them make choices and come to conclusions that you as an audience sort of know is probably wrong but you understand where they're coming from so it doesn't make them stupid but it makes them they're trying they're just not hitting the target yet over the course of abigail as certain things come you know to, to pass for these characters for the first half i'm thinking I kind of have an idea of what's happening right now. They don't, and I'm enjoying the ride of watching them figure it out. And I think one of the more brilliant aspects of the script is you have a group of people who aren't really talking about themselves. They don't even want to use their real names. And and yet you have to find a way to endear them to the audience, even though all of them are willing to kidnap a young girl. Granted, uh, our lead character who goes by the name Joey didn't know it was a young girl, but still, that's a that's a hard ask for the script. And it achieves it extremely well in one scene that I thought was just like a brilliant way to handle character exposition in that you establish Joey as someone who is uh, has pretty good intuition for who someone is. And you watch her like go to each character and be like, I think I, I think I know who you are. I think I know who you are. I think I know who you are. And she's right. And so we learn about them. I thought that was pretty brilliant. Thank you. That's yeah. that's one of our favorite scenes in the movie. It, it feels like that's the scene when the movie kind of casts casts its spell over the audience. That's the experience that we've had in in the screenings. That people, I think, they've they, they've shown up for a very specific thing, and then they realize, and and it always happens around that scene. They realize that they're actually falling in love with these characters and this ensemble, and that to us was such a such a pivotal scene in achieving 
in achieving that very thing to have people go in and go oh wait a minute this movie is going to do far more than i expected it to do far more than maybe what i've seen in in a trailer and um and it, it was also very uh, oddly and coincidentally the first scene that we shot uh of mm. the film was that big ensemble scene and and uh, there was there was a lot of pressure going into that first day of shooting there always is on any movie and um to see the cast show up and play a scene where the characters in the movie are getting to know each other as our cast is also figuring each other out and and how to work in the dynamic of the ensemble. It was just a really amazing moment and we felt a lot of pressure lift off of our shoulders during the the shooting of that scene. We knew that we were, I mean, in the presence of just remarkable, remarkable actors. And we were so, we were so surprised to feel how different all of those characters are uh, within, within the story. Kevin Durand, I, I'm not sure if you've heard this before, but I felt the most empathy for him. There's these handful of moments where characters will poke at him for his supposed lack of intellect. Um, yeah. And he he kind of lets this side of him be seen where he's like, maybe stop. I might kill you. And I, I really, <laughs> I, I really yeah. love those scenes with him. Yeah, I mean, thanks for saying that, because we feel the same way. I think Kevin, what Kevin brought to that character is really special. You know, there was a lot of like, the groundwork was laid in the script and then Kevin really took it and elevated it to this, that th there's like a real sadness, you know, you yeah. feel it like in that scene with Joey, when she's talks about, you know, that his dad probably beat him and he just kind of takes it. And it's, it's very, it's very moving and it makes you just kind of fall in love with them a little. And then I think one of the things that we found in the screenings is that, and it's probably because of exactly what you're saying, where he's like a brute force, but also there's something very gentle and caring. Everybody wants to laugh when he gives them a moment. You know, we found, we, we always thought his performance was funny. I don't think we realized yeah, that, that it was going to be as funny as yeah. it was with an audience. And we were thrilled the first time we saw people reacting to him. He's terrific in the movie, as is uh, Alicia Weir, uh, who plays Abigail. So much is required of her. She has to play that sort of innocent child at first with the, the crocodile tears of, you know, I don't know what's going on. Why are you doing this to me? And you have to feel sort of sympathy for her. And then all of a sudden there's this turn where she's not so sympathetic anymore. And she does it all in the physical stuff, too. I imagine she probably had to do a lot of physical yeah. stuff, too, with wires and whatnot. I, I mean, the, she does the majority of the physical stuff. I, I think that we knew we were asking a lot from her going into the shoot. I don't think we were expecting to get more than what we were asking and we did every day I, yeah. there were there were instances of shooting where you know our, our stunt coordinator would come up to us and you know part part a conversation that's always being had on set is you know what's the handoff between you know an actor and and a stunt performer and there were countless days on this movie when we'd have that be having that conversation with with our stunt coordinator and he'd say no, 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 this is all Alicia. Alicia can do do all of this stuff. And not only can she do it, she's actually, she's better She's better than her double because she has a dance background. And, I, and he sort of would list all of these, all of these things that Alicia just possesses, you know, through hard work and some of them just very naturally. Um, but it was, it was really, really profound to watch her not only be great in these like very intimate, emotional, vulnerable scenes, but then to also just become an, an absolute beast when it came to the action stuff. It was it was just really, really the contrast between those things. Uh, and sometimes those things happen in the same day. You know, you you show up and you shoot a quiet, emotional scene in the morning and then you, you come back after lunch and you're, you know, you're, you're running your characters through the house in the middle of a chase. And and to see to see those those that switch flip so naturally in her was just really really fun. We were entertained by her performance every day behind the monitors. I'm curious with a, a film that has such a massive cast in regards to just like you you've got a lot of principal characters. Yeah, it's contained, but you still have a lot of schedules to work around, and one of them is a child. And so, what is it like to schedule a movie like Abigail to get everyone on that page where it's mm -hmm. like this is the most efficient way to plan this out, where we can do the action, we can do the blood gags, and we we have a, a young person on set as well. I mean, we had an incredible team out there. Our AD. UPM line producer and like the whole team just working really hard to make that work because that is a, Such a puzzle fucking puzzle and you know and then throw on top of that we have two strikes so there's 
there's figuring out how to do all that. And so on top of that, it turns out in Ireland, which we didn't know, I mean, we could have looked it up, but uh, it gets dark at about 11 o'clock at night and sunny at like 3.30 in the morning when we were filming. <laughs> wow. So, you know, we're shooting a vampire movie and it's basically <laughs> sunny all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the scheduling on this was like insane, but, it, but I, I think it, at the end of the day, it's just a lot of hard work and a lot of just moving pieces around. And, you know, some of that or majority of that happens with like Ron and Dara and Neve and they figure out, it's like, how can we, we have Alicia for this period of time. Mm -hmm. What can we do here that's effective in this moment, you know, and really use every moment. I think at the end of the day, we, we never, we felt the pressure of the time. But yeah. we also, we were never like chasing it. You know, it was, it was, it was really well scheduled. And if you want to get into like the nitty gritty production stuff, you know, that sort of starts, that design starts with our AD and, yeah. and line producer. And, and then once we have a general sense of like the hours, the amount of time we're going to need to shoot certain, certain sections of the movie, we then sort of can sort of break out Alicia's, Alicia's time on set. Cause she also then would have to break to do schooling um you know every every two hours well she had to take a break just a normal break yeah a normal break and then there was a break for school and a lunch break and we only had her for a total of eight hours a day and that included the two you know two hours in the makeup chair so so when when she hit set you know it was it was really go time and so then that that conversation about the schedule it comes down through us and we have a conversation with our dp about you know those those bigger scenes particularly ones that are high page count you know there's a there's a scene that um, I don't know how many how many pages the seller scene is 10, 10, 10, pages 10 11 yeah. pages and most of that is Alicia you know on on camera delivering delivering lines and and we talked a lot about just um, in terms of like the coverage methodology being able to obviously start the scene and the sequence on on Alicia cover out as much of that as we could knowing that you know midway through the scene we're going to sort of jump to the other side of the line because we love long talking scenes to feel like they have some visual evolution even if there's not a lot of Movement. camera movements or a lot of you know physical blocking moves in the scene and then you know we we would know that when Alicia went on break, that the lighting setups, that the lighting setup that was required to flip around and look the other way was going to be minimal, so that if she went off set for an hour, we would be able to spin around and cover out one, maybe two instances of of uh, coverage on on you know our other characters, and then when she was back with us, immediately flip yeah. around. So we were we were turning the world around quite a bit on this movie, <clears throat> and Aaron Morton, our DP, was I, I think just really we couldn't have asked for anybody better to to help achieve that he's he's um he's so fast and he's so smart about the way that uh the yeah, way that really thoughtful about yeah the sort of set the camera and the set runs um so that was it was it was a challenge but it was really fun it was it was always a part of the creative process for us designing how to shoot those days Speaking of the DP, I mean, I, I could have sworn this movie was lit by like old fashioned oil lamps because it, everything just looks so orange and warm and uh, really, really beautiful. I just want to compliment you guys on that. Thank you. Yeah, he's incredible. We should say like the, the, the look of this movie too, there's there's very little processing and color done in the DI. I mean, it's, you know, Aaron, and this is something that we've, we try to, we've tried to achieve on all of our movies, but that, you know, the LUT that's applied to the, to the dailies, that the, the show LUT is as close to the version of the movie and how we want it to look as is in our minds. And um, it takes time, it takes a little more time to, to achieve that, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the most of the time that we spend with the movie is in the edit and you, you've, you fall in love with your work print and you want the thing that you fall in love with to be as, as close to the finished product as possible. And, and Aaron really achieved that visually for us. You know, you mentioned work prints and uh, something that I've sort of dealt with uh, is just the getting married to a temp score and and how sometimes, <laughs> you know, hearing a temp score over and over again, you, you, you sort of like, well, can you can you just like have it be like that? Because that just sounds that's that's perfect. What I've been what I've put in here. But then you have to, you know, go through this period where you're sort of divorcing yourself from it. And, and... yeah, you have to retrain your retrain your brain and your ears. Yeah. You know, this is our fourth movie in a row with Brian Tyler doing the score. And, you know, Brian is well, he's a fucking literal genius and he's so good at what he does and he gets our tone really well and how he can complement it and really make it work the best. And we have this very weird 
somewhat unique, I think, experience with Brian as our composer, where we hear the suite, we talk about it a lot, you know, we go back and forth, but at the end of the day, Brian kind of delivers us a, a fully baked score two weeks before we're done mixing or something, very towards the end. And I, I, I think on this one, maybe more than any of them, it's always been great, but we put that score in and after like one or two watches, you're like, what did we even have in here before? I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't fucking remember. Like it just, it washes it away because he does such a complete version that feels so Cohesive. like it's just part of the movie and you kind yeah. of don't know how it wasn't there the whole time. I think that that's the hard thing too about temping our tone is that it's, it's a lot of the music that we try, it feels like it's in too specific a lane. And what Brian does is he creates this like, he creates, he writes music for us that feels really traditional and timeless. And it doesn't, it, it, it sort of pushes, pushes you emotionally in places, but it's only ever really pushing you emotionally. It's not ever, not ever really pushing the tone. You know, it's not ever no. wacky or comedic. It's, it's a actually little, fighting. Yeah, it, it's sort of. Yeah, he sort way. of is like counter programming the tone at times. Um, and I think that for us is uh, the reason that our relationship with him has worked is we we come out of a temp with a real hodgepodge of music, and they're all great. Our music editors that we've worked with, who who yeah. have like been in the trenches cutting temp for us. I, I mean, mean, that is a hard job, ben, an extremely difficult job. The yeah, the dude Ben Zales on this one, wonderful guy. I mean, he spent eight months with us doing temp scores, and just to make sure that the tone, yeah, that the movie was was working, that it was funny when it wanted to be funny, but it wasn't a comedy, and that it was scary when it was when it wanted to be scary, but it wasn't mean. And then Brian comes in, and I think you know he creates cohesion, and that's ultimately yeah. I think what what makes it all feel like it's just all of a of a single piece there's always a perspective I, i'm always curious to hear filmmakers talk about and that is sort of that first initial whether it's a test screening or a family and friends screening or, or or just showing it to a few random people looking for feedback i've spoken to a lot of people who've made tons of movies they all say the same thing it never they're never like calm during that process <laughs> no. it's it's always like oh my god what is going to happen because i think you make a movie and you, you hope you know the tone you you hope you you understand the film but at the end of the day someone else is always going to tell you something about your movie you didn't realize and and so what yeah. has that experience been like for you uh you know through I don't know how involved you were with with VHS or Southbound, but you know, obviously, Ready or Not through Abigail, I imagine you had test screenings. And, and what what has that experience been like for you? If, if there was something you could glean from it in general? Well, I can tell you on Southbound, <laughs> <laughs> we did a Southbound screening, and I play one of the characters in Southbound. And the first note after the screening was, "These two fucking clowns in the first <laughs> segment." I just really hate them. Just don't like, like their performance. I'm like two rows back. I'm like, oh, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Uh, but I think, wow. I, you know, honestly, you have to prepare for that level of it's not. It's 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 usually not quite that personal, but you do have to prepare for that level of like, you're going to hear things that are gonna suck, but you know, you have to be really honest about how you digest them. Because yeah. sometimes it's just not, you don't care. You're like, that's fine. It's not, that no harm, no foul, whatever. But sometimes you go, okay, they're saying something that we feel. And that this is just proving to us that we actually do need to listen to our instincts on this. And, and, and try to figure out what's broken here. And I think, I, I think our biggest fear, I mean, correct me if you feel differently, but is less the experience of watching them or watching it with a test audience, which is always so nerve wracking. And like you were saying, you just don't know what you're going to get. But it it's also the the data can get weaponized. How, how it's interpreted. Yeah. Yeah. And so after the fact, it can become everybody can find the one person who agrees with them and says a thing. And you can get into these kind of endless debates that are at the that end of the day. Consensus. Yeah, that are kind of silly. Yeah. And you're sort of just chasing nonsense. And I think I think we our anxiety going into test screenings is less about the actual test screening, which is a part of the process we actually find really valuable. Yeah, and we really actually love and, yeah, getting the movie up in front of an audience. Yeah, and it's really helpful because because we don't need an audience to tell us half the time when something is not working in the in the cards. We feel it the moment it's not working, and we'll turn to each other in the test screening and be like, "Oh fuck, we got to figure this out. This still this is not working." 
And, you know, being really honest with yourself is great, but it's the after the test screening part of the process that, you know, if the test screening goes really well, those notes become, well, if you like them, do them. If you don't, don't worry about it. But if the test screening doesn't go well, it becomes very unfun very quickly. I really enjoyed the film. I think audiences are going to have a fun time with it. I also think it's coming out at a good time. People need to have fun with the movies and, and just uh, relax and, and watch something that makes them you know, takes them on a ride, but doesn't make them feel good. You know, and I just, as a horror fan, as a horror buff my whole life, I had a smile on my face for most of this movie. So thanks for making it. Thank, Thank you. you. Really fun to be on the podcast too. Yeah, this is great. Having us.